Uh, so we'll start the webinar session now. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to weekly webinar organized by College of Physician Malaysia. We are now in week four of endocrine month. Topic for today is approach to male hypogonadism. For topic for today, we are fortunate to welcome Associate Prof. Dr. Jaya Kanta as the chairperson and Dr. Kang Wei Han as a speaker today. Prof. Jaya Kanta is a senior consultant endocrinologist and head of endocrine division of uh, University Malaya Medical Center. He has obtained his undergraduate degree from National University of Malaysia and his master's degree in internal medicine from University of Malaya. He completed his advanced training in endocrinology with, with the in Ministry of Health Malaysia and has undergone a fellowship in endocrinology at the Princess Alexandra Hospital, Brisbane, Australia. He to per, further pursue his interest in neuroendocrinology has also undergone an attachment at the Auckland City Hospital Pituitary Centre in New Zealand and, and the Cambridge University Endocrine Clinic at the Edinburgh Hospital in the United Kingdom. Besides managing patients with endocrine disorder, he plays an active role as an investigator in the field of endocrinology, diabetes and osteoporosis. He has published papers in, in academic journals and actively speaks in scientific meetings. He is currently the council member of Malaysian Endocrine and Metabolic Society. Diabetes Malaysia and Malaysian Osteoporosis Society. He also sits in the editorial board of the Asian Journal of Diabetology. Prof. Jaya also is particularly interested in the field of neuroendocrinology, aiming at improving outcomes for patients living with pituitary disorder. Without further ado, uh, let's welcome Prof. Jaya and Dr. Good. Kang. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for that very kind introduction, Dr. Priscilla. Um, before I begin, I would like to thank the College of Physicians Malaysia for inviting uh, Dr. Kang and I to actually uh, do this last bit of uh, endocrine series webinar. Um, and it gives me great pleasure actually to introduce our speaker for today, um, none other than Dr. Kang Wei Han. Um, he's very well known and he's actually going to take us through the uh, uh, issues or rather the approach to male hypogonadism. So a little bit about Dr. Kang, he's actually a clinical assistant professor at University of uh, Tungku Abdurrahman, Utah. Um, and he's also a visiting uh, consultant endocrinologist at a few other private hospitals like Sungai Long Specialist Hospital, uh, Beacon Hospital, Annur, Eye Heal, as well as Columbia Asia. So Dr. Kang is very, very passionate and his niche interest field is really in male hypogonadism. Um, he's undergone a fellowship at the Fiona Stanley Hospital in Western Australia with Professor Bu Yip, uh, who is a world-renowned figure uh, for male hypogonadism. So um, you guys know the usual drill. Uh, there will be a lecture by Dr. Kang, and then uh, please do put in your questions in the Q&A box, uh, and we will have time to actually address all the questions. So male hypogonadism uh, is a topic that is not easy, even for us endocrinologists. Uh, I think definitely for general physicians, it is uh, a challenging topic. So to take us through this, um, to take us through how do we go through a systematic approach uh, as well as some of the caveats in terms of testing, as well as what are the updates uh, we have with us, Dr. Kang. Um, and the Zoom is yours, Dr. Kang. Uh, thank you so much, Prof. Uh, first of all, I'll just to share my screen first. Okay. Yep, I think the slides are up. Yeah, so, we uh, can see it clearly. Thank you. So a very good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, uh, Prof. Jaya, for the very kind introduction. And also thank you very much to the College of Physicians for inviting me to speak on this topic. Uh, so I was uh, asked to give a topic for endocrine, uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, lecture series. And I thought uh, that uh, giving a lecture on a male hypogonadism would be quite interesting, as I think no one has done before. And then uh, this subject is actually quite niche. Lah. And uh, sorry to say that uh, the testis is always the most forgotten endocrine organs lah, in our field. So um, uh, the word uh, testis actually comes from the Latin word uh, ochis, la, okay? ochis means, means testicles. So ochis, sorry, ochis actually means testis in Greek. So um, uh, it's a beautiful flower, but then again, um, uh, somehow we don't really remember, la, or we can't really connect that. Testis is actually associated with orchids. So this is one of the famous orchids that we see, it's called a naked man orchid, because uh, it looks grossly like a man. La or a naked man. So we'll start off with a case one. I have, uh, because I think that most of our audience will be uh, general physicians or maybe general practitioners. So I made my slides a bit easy. 
But then again, we are always free to discuss it later if you have any other further questions. Now. So um, I'll start with a simple case. Uh, this was a 45 years old Chinese male uh, referred to me uh, by my surgical colleague. So the patient has uh, no known medical illness, never checked before. So he came to the surgeon for renal colleague. At the time, there was pain, very, very classical pain, uh, loin to groin. Uh, there was also hematuria 1 plus or urea FME. And they proceed with a CT urography and it shows stones in the left kidney with no pictures of obstruction. So um, the surgeon noted that the HB was a bit lowish, 10.4 like grams per deciliter for a male. And uh, the other parameters, the MCV, MCH, MCHC were all normal. So I was thinking that probably it could be um, normal cytic, normal chromic anemia. The commoners will of course be GI bleed. So they did an OGDS and a chronoscopy, both were normal. And uh, the calcium was normal as well. That's why it did not refer me for hypercalcemia. But then again, it just said, okay, uh, maybe medical should come and see just to rule out any medical causes. Like. So um, <clears throat> when I saw the patient, there was no symptoms just of, of uh, severe anemia. Uh, there was no history of blood loss from any orifices as well. No history of hemolysis, jaundice. Um, uh, no constitutional or B symptoms. He's single, not sexually active. He's a non-smoker. Uh, he's a social drinker and he works as a carpenter. La. Financially, he says he's stable, no issues, and uh, he's a uh, non vegetarian, that means he, he eats meat. La. Okay, so trying to rule out dietary causes of uh, iron deficiency and etc. But then again, it's still an NCHC anemia. La. No family history of thalassemia or the other sorts. So when you examine him, he's actually a bit obese. La. BMI is 29.4, but if you follow the Asia Pacific uh, criteria, he's already obese. BP was a bit high, 139.70. Uh, heart rate was regular, normal. And we did a random dextrose. Lah. So it was a one hour post meal uh, sugar. So it was 8.2. And uh, we examined everything. It looks normal, like grossly. The cardiovascular, recipe, abdomen, neuro, uh, neuromuscular, joints, everything. It looks normal. So I looked back at the investigation results. So HP was 10.4. And uh, I repeated another one. It came back as 11.3. So if you look at the normal range, it is still a bit lowish. La. MCV, MCH, MCHC were also within normal range. White cell and platelets normal. Renal profile was normal, but the liver function test suggested maybe a bit of NASH, uh, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. Um, uh, HDL was lowish. TG was high-ish, suggestive of a metabolic syndrome. A1C is 6.0, pre-diabetic. Uh, OGDS, coloscopy were normal. Nothing was abnormal was seen. ECG and X-ray were actually normal. So we look back at this patient, he was actually referred to me for anemia. So I was thinking very hard, why was he anemic? So, you know, looking back at the history, you think everything and as usual. So the first question would come as uh, he's single and uh, not such an active. So of course, you know, being busy body. So you were trying to ask a patient, uh, usually a young male, okay, uh, do you, would you explain why you are not such an active? Probably because you have performance or you're anemic, you're tired or anything or fatigue, anything. So he said that, um, doctor, actually, I don't, I don't have any libido at all. So I don't feel like having sex at all. So from that, uh, it got me a bit suspicious. Lah. So you put a question him. He said, um, uh, morning erections is very poor, almost no erections at all. And uh, the function was very poor. So we, we asked him, uh, how long has this been there? He said, oh, for a very, very long time. Okay, even since he was a teenager, he's not just not like any other young people, his libido was very low. La. And when you look at him, there was no, not much facial hair. The body hair was also quite scanty. But then again, most Chinese males are not very beardy or hairy. La. Okay. And uh, we asked him about OSA symptoms because he's obese and a, a metabolic syndrome, he denies. So picking on this low libido, so I just did a test. La. Okay. Um, uh, for me, in my mind, I was thinking uh, HB was low in a male somehow, which is a bit unusual. Libido is low with this uh, sexual dysfunction and also non-specific symptoms of tiredness. So I proceeded with a genital examination, which physicians we rarely do. Okay, So I was a bit surprised because uh, there was some abnormality. Uh, the tenor staging was stage 5. Okay, The penis actually was normal. But the testis was actually a bit small for a normal man. So the testis was actually six mils bilaterally. 
normally a man's uh, testis should be around 16 mils and above. So he has small testis bilaterally, but the testis, uh, but the other genes was normal. And uh, there was no gynecomastia. Frequently, your thyroid, no goiter, no visual field effects or acromegalic features or Cushingon features or any features to suggest a uh, uh, pituitary cause. So uh, this is what we call our endocrine rosary. Like it's just an okidometer that uh, most of us, we do not really use. So I have it one, but it costs around, I think, 50 to 100 bucks if you buy it from Lazada or Shopee. So by right, a physician should, should have it. Lah. But if having said so, we rarely use it unless we suggest that, no, I mean, it's, unless we suspect that there is a testicular problem. Lah. So using a Prada okidometer, the testis was actually quite small lah, for a young male. It was only six meals. So further history, okay, uh, he achieved his puberty at the age of 13. There were no other history of testicular trauma, mumps, or chitis, radiation to the genitalia, okay, or there was uh, there's no any history of chemotherapy as well. He enjoys his single life. For him, he said he doesn't mind being single. Okay, uh, sexual dysfunction is not an issue for him. No plans to get married, and then of course, uh, don't want to get don't want to have kids lah. And the low libido is not a concern. That's why he has not been seeking any treatment for this issue. Okay, so if we look at the guidelines suggested by uh, Basin et al., so this is uh, one of the guidelines that we use for hypograndism. So if you suspect someone with a history of uh, hypograndism, okay, uh, history, his, historical wise, suggestion of that, and also when you examine, you think he has hypograndism, um, you should proceed with further testing, okay, biochemical testing to confirm. However, there are other conditions like systemic illness, drugs, nutritional deficiency that may lower the testosterone. So you should check testosterone in a relatively healthy man. If a patient is unwell in ICU for uh, intubated or very ill septic, it is not advisable to check for, te for testosterone lah, because obviously it will be very low. So we tend to rule out other potential uh, causes that can be lower the testosterone due to other causes. Lah. Okay. If there are no other reasons, you suspect that it is a hypogonism, okay, then you should, you should measure the morning fasting total T, total testosterone. Uh, why morning? Because uh, a heavy meal will reduce your testosterone. So if a patient had, has had a heavy breakfast, it will go down. Okay, The testosterone will be low. Uh, if you check the testosterone after 11 a.m., Okay, the testosterone will be falsely lower as well because uh, testosterone is secreted at the diurnal variation. In the morning, it will be very high. Okay, and in the evening, after 11, it will slowly go down. If you check your testosterone at around uh, 5 p.m., 6 p.m., it should be low. So it will be low, but it is normal because it is secreted that way. So the best would be to do it early in a fasting sample. And if you suspect the patient may have uh, certain conditions that the sex hormone binding globally is, is uh, altered or if the borderline is if, if the total t is a bit borderline low you can proceed with a free testosterone okay and of course if the fertility is an issue you can proceed with semen analysis lah. and if the testosterone is normal okay then the patient most likely does not have hypogonadism then you should consider other causes for the uh, for the clinical presentation if it is low okay, or low T, by right, you should repeat another sample because it is very common, okay, to have uh, essay interference or other things that may interfere uh, the, the testosterone levels, okay? So usually we need two, two samples to confirm. One is confirmed, then we proceed on further, okay? So after you have confirmed that the patient has hypogonism, now the question is, is it a primary or a secondary? Primary means a, a problem at the testis level, okay? Uh, so it will be LS, LH and FSH will be very high because no testosterone to suppress it, okay? But if your LH and FSH is low or inappropriately normal, usually it reflects that there is something at the hypothalamus or at the uh, pituitary level because they are unable to mount a response to increase uh, testosterone. So with that, then we can know whether it's the primary or a secondary, because the approach will be different. If it's primary, you usually focus on something okay, that is causing problems at the testis level. It could be a history of mums or chitis, it could be an undecided testis, or it could be a genetic 
a problem like uh, client filters or etc. But if it is at the pituitary level, it can be other things. It can be a pituitary tumor. It can be due to uh, infiltrative disorders, okay? Sarcoidosis, it could be a uh, hemochromatosis for thalassemia, or it could be a non-functioning pituitary tumor as well, okay? So the, the pathway to, to further investigate would differ, whether it's a primary or a secondary. So for this patient, uh, after he has gone back, I told him that um, you can come back again and see me like, two weeks. Then we will repeat again to see your testosterone levels and see how it goes. So uh, the first one, okay, in the ward, it was uh, 1.6, which is actually very, very low. Because for a normal person, it should be at least more than 12. So the first one in the ward was 1.6. But then again, he's in the ward, he's a bit unwell. So, okay, it may be a false, false, uh, falsely lowered. But usually not to the extent. Uh, if it's low, if it's falsely lower, it should be around 8 to 12, borderline low. But if it's less than 8, most likely it is very low. So after two weeks, when I repeated it again, it was low as well, 1.4. Okay, so at the same time, I proceeded with uh, FSH and LH. So if you look at the range, both were higher than usual. So it's, it shows that testosterone is low and the pituitary is actually functioning well because they, it tries to compensate by increasing your FSH and LH. So this is a primary hypogonadism. So um, based on everything, okay, uh, it, our next intention will be find out what is causing this gentleman to have low testosterone levels. However, the patient said that, no, uh, doctor, yeah, it is abnormal, but then again, for me, I'm fine with it, okay? Um, I don't feel anything different. Sex is not important for me. I don't, I don't have a partner. I don't want to have children. So yeah, I think I just leave it alone. However, after counseling the patient, you know, the long-term effects of uh, low cholesterol, it may affect the bones, uh, cholesterol levels, etc. cetera, which is still not keen. So I, so I told him, okay, la, why don't you just lose your weight, exercise and diet for the metabolic syndrome part, and then I still three months again, we dis we, we discussed the issue. And uh, unfortunately, the patient defaulted the follow-up. So that's the end of him. That I've seen him. Lah, okay. So uh, we just go back a little bit basic. So what is testosterone? So we all know that it is a sex steroid that controls our manliness in males. Okay. So a bit of history. It was initially discovered by... Uh, Arnold Adolf Bertol, a uh, German zoologist and physiologist. So he noticed that you know, if you remove gonads from a uh, rooster, okay, they actually do not grow normally. But if you re-implant it back, they grow into normal roosters. So there uh, must be something in the gonads that's causing the rooster to, to become uh, an adult rooster. Okay? And it was only until like uh, 1930s where Brown Sequard came up with the idea of uh, rejuvenating Alexei. So he used uh, uh, his own concoction made from dog and guinea pig testes, okay, and injected himself. Somehow he reported that, you know, after I injected, I feel good. So Brown Sequel actually now is the father of uh, anabolic steroids abuser. Like. Okay, he's the first person who thought of this con concept of using testosterone as an anti-aging, okay, or make a uh, feel good uh, drug something. Okay, so, but because of that, uh, his study, his, his, uh, his experiment, it received a lot of backlash and the uh, idea of testosterone, actually, uh, it was, uh, the, it was impeded. Lah. So there was not much research for that. Until 1939, where another German uh, researcher discovered testosterone and it was awarded a Nobel Prize for this. So 1939 to 1950, it was the golden age of steroid chemistry, where there were various research done on testosterone, experimenting on it, they discovered new uh, synthetic uh, versions of testosterone. They actually applied testosterone, trying to treat patients with weight loss, uh, malnourished patients, males uh, uh, with testosterone, and see how it goes. But then again, uh, it stopped lah, in 1960. So there was just a bit of history of uh, testosterone. So what is the function of testosterone? In males particularly, uh, it actually regulates our sexual function. Okay, As, you, as boys become men, Okay, uh, the testosterone actually regulates the penile and the scrotal formation. It stimulates the prostate and genitals during puberty, influences sexual behavior, maintains their sex drive, sperm count, and fertility. 
And uh, somehow it's been proven that testosterone helps okay, to maintain a feeling of well-being. Okay, and it aids okay, uh, in, the, in the male patient's uh, cognitive behavior. So, so-called that you know, males may have better spatial orientation according to female, but we're not sure how true it is. And some has postulated it could be due to testosterone. And of course, if testosterone makes a man aggressive, Okay, and uh, it reduces anxiety and depression as well. In the body, okay, it maintains the, the man, masculine look. So you have bigger bones, bigger muscle volume and mass. You have a uh, manly appearance, beard. Okay, uh, for males, sometimes male pattern balding as well. Uh, it induces the male, vo uh, typical, sorry, the influence of male voice. Okay, and uh, other than that, um, uh, testosterone also regulates uh, sperm, sperm production in the testes. It's a more of a paracrine uh, activity. And also, um, uh, there are other things that may affect the testosterone levels. Okay, uh, SHPG level, how much testosterone is produced, how fast it's degraded, and whether anything affects the metabolism. Okay, those are believed to, to can affect your levels of testosterone. And of course, we know stress, diet, weather, sexual stimuli, sports, and other supplements, they can affect your testosterone levels as well. So these are how, uh, how, how important testosterone is to a male, okay? And for ladies as well, they have a bit of testosterone in their body. So it is believed that testosterone um, affects the libido in women as well. So in, uh, so in a, in, if, if, a lady, if a woman has, um, if a female patient has a low libido, okay, you can actually prescribe testosterone to increase the libido. Okay, if you have they if they have a sexual dysfunction in females, okay, but for males, yes, it is quite important. So, what are the symptoms of uh, hypogonadism in males? So, there can be a myriad of symptoms. It can be very specific or non-specific. Okay, so non-specific can be fatigue, tiredness. Um, uh, get they feel tired easily. Um, they feel depressed, low motivation, no mood, and etc. So it's actually very difficult to pick up, okay? Because sometimes if you listen, you think that it, be, it could be just hypothyroid or they can be just depressed or anemic or other, other pathology that's causing all these symptoms. But the very, very specific symptoms that you should ask is, uh, number one is, um, uh, what is their libido, okay? And how is their sexual function and how is their morning erections? Sometimes they may just have erectile dysfunction due to other things like diabetes or smoke or they are, they are, they are heavy smokers, etc. But then again, Okay, sexual symptoms are quite specific for hypogonadism. Okay, others will include loss of body hair and also uh, testicular atrophy. Okay, other things that may suggest but are not specific includes uh, breast enlargement like gynecomastia, uh, infertility, okay, uh, maybe osteopenia, osteoporosis in males, hot flushes and sweats, which can be mistaken for hot weather in Malaysia, okay, and other things. So, the symptoms wise, it may be a bit difficult. So you might have you might need to have a bit of high suspicion okay, in patients with uh, hypogonadism. Sometimes they have sexual dysfunction, but then again, they are actually the testosterone is normal. So they are not hypogonadal. Okay, so it may not be easy. And uh, there have been a few questionnaire designed to ask about hypogonadism, for instance, the Adam, uh, Adam questionnaire or the AMS questionnaire. Those are more of uh, academic use. It is sometimes oversensitive. Okay, uh, some patients their testosterone are normal, but then again they will have these kind of symptoms. So the questionnaire may not be that useful, lah. Okay. So as mentioned, other non-specific symptoms include uh, low motivation, they are depressed. Okay, poor concentration and memory, sleep disturbance. Okay, mild anemia, reduced muscle bulk, body fat, etc. Okay. So. In a patient with testosterone deficiency, they can be a bit emotional, okay? They may look different a bit, or abnormal obesity, loss of libido, okay? And uh, for the reproductive system, they may be subfertile or infertile, loss of pubic hair or body hair, and then sexual dysfunction. And a long-term complication, can, it can lead to osteopenia or osteoporosis in males. Uh, your lipids may go up a bit and higher risk of uh, cardiovascular uh, coronary artery diseases. You may get insulin resistance and higher risk of obesity or diabetes. And also, in the long run, your muscle bulk will shrink. And in the elderly, there will be a higher chance of getting sarcopenia. Okay. <clears throat> so, 
Um, once you have confirmed that a patient is hypogonad, you need to determine whether is it primary or secondary. So for the organic causes, primary, the commonest is Kalman's, uh, sorry, Kleinfelter syndrome. And you have other things like cryptocortism, uh, myotomy dystrophica. If you have damage or any radiation to the testis, if you have mumps or kitis in a young age, testicular torsion or trauma, or if the patient is just simply very, very old already. Okay, secondary can be other things like uh, idiopathic IHH. It can be infiltrative diseases, uh, hematochromosis due to thalassemia, or it can be a tumor there. Okay, and of course, there are various secondary causes or functional causes. For instance, uh, patient with uh, on dialysis, kidney, kidney disease, they can have low testosterone as well. If they are on certain medications for their prostate, okay, or androgen synthesis inhibitors, for secondary, it can be other things like uh, hyperproteinemia. If they are obese, they are on opioids, uh, drug abuse, they are unwell, they are too thin, they can't sleep well, they are very stressed. All these can have low testosterone levels as well. Okay, So uh, now we go to a case two, okay, where we discuss another aspect of it. So uh, you have two male siblings. Okay, uh, They were both diagnosed with secondary hypogonadism when they were young because they had a uh, delayed puberty and also absent sexual characteristics. Um, they defaulted follow-up with the pediatric team, but came back later as an adult at around late 20s because the elder brother got married and uh, after two years could not uh, father any children. So he came for fertility consultation. So of course, symptom-wise, libido is low, poor sexual function, but there were no other complaints. On examination, both siblings were obese. Okay, BMI was for more than 40 like, for both. They had sparse pubic uh, body hair for a, for a Malay gentleman. Okay, Asian Malays are more hairier. Uh, but their body hair is a bit sparse. The penis length is small. Testes are small bladder as well, less than six males. And they have acanthosis nigricans. Okay, so uh, the smell is normal. Okay, and no visual defects. So I was trying to rule out uh, Coleman's disease. Okay. And also any pituitary problems. So if you look at the biochemical parameters for the two siblings, the cortisol was actually a bit borderline lowish, but they have no symptoms. ACTH is uh, a bit highish. Okay, LH, FSH were a bit low. Prolactin was within normal range. TSH, T4, everything was still okay. But the testosterone were levels were severely low lah, for two. Karyotyping was normal. This was done by the PITS team lah, on back then. Ultrasound. Uh, shows that the, uh, the, the testis was very small. These were all some of the older results that we got. And then uh, MRI was normal. But for the elder brother, there seemed to be a micro adenoma scene. Okay? But we think it's not related to the, uh, to the hypogonadal condition. A1C 5.4, 5.6. LDL is uh, still okay. HDL is lowish for the elder brother. Uh, and then TG is still okay for both. So in this patient, the highlight is they have low testosterone and low LH FSH. So this is a secondary hypogonadism. Okay, so we explained to the brothers, okay, um, your testosterone is very low. Treatment options will depend on what you want. Okay, because if you replace testosterone, it will cause infertility because high supraphysiological doses of testosterone will inhibit sperm formation. Okay, if fertility is a concern, okay, we will have to refer and co-manage with uh, co manage with a fertility expert, okay? And then uh, we cannot give you testosterone. But if fertility is not a concern, we can start you with uh, testosterone anytime, okay? Having said that, it is still important to determine whether is there any underlying genetic abnormality, okay, in this patient. So if, because if they want to have children, if there's a genetic problem, then the children may have the same condition as well. So we referred the patient to UM uh, genetic clinic for genetic testing, but the patient was not keen uh, due to uh, financial cost. Okay, so we started the patient with uh, testosterone treatment, the younger brother, because he's not keen to get married yet. So what can we do for this patient? So um, there are various uh, testosterone replacement options that we can use. It depends on your center, what you have, and what the patient prefers. So the commonest we have is uh, testosterone inantate which is what we have where you inject, uh, you can inject monthly, okay? And sometimes it depends, okay, how, how the patient reacts. 
So if you inject the patient with this uh, enantate IM, the testosterone will go up very fast. Then it will slowly come down. Okay, by the end, then when 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 after two after the two to four weeks, the levels will be quite low. So the patients will have peaks and troughs. During peaks, they will feel very aggressive. Okay, very angry, very aggressive, very energetic. But when when the effect has waned down, they will be very, very low. They feel very tired, no libido, etc. So enantate is cheap, relatively cheap, widely available. Okay, but you have these peaks and troughs. Okay, so it may not be easy to use. Okay, sometimes if, if the peak is too high, you might want to use a lower dose. Okay, sometimes the trough is too frequent, you might want to give it more frequent, too weekly. Okay, so it depends. Uh, another option is uh, using gel, which is available in Malaysia now. So gel, it is prepared in a sachet. You just open it up and you apply on your chest or your abdomen. Okay, so don't apply it at the genitalia. Okay, you apply the abdomen or the chest. So it is the the concentration is lesser compared to to using injection. So you don't get the supra physiological side effects. And there will be less patients because you apply every day. Okay, the only thing about this is uh, one is it is relatively expensive in Malaysia, and uh, if you apply on your skin, okay, and if there is direct contact to a female partner, the wife or the spouse or a child, there's a chance that you may transfer the testosterone to the wife or the or your children. So there may be a chance of her uh, viralization in the wife. The wife may may grow a beard or become more hairy, and the child may get to uh precautious puberty, okay, due to this. So we will advise the patient, after you apply, don't contact, okay, try not to contact, okay. So sometimes it can feel a bit sticky, especially in Malaysia, the hot weather, it will make it a bit sticky, okay. So uh, this is an option, gel, which is quite good, but then again, the pricing is another issue, la. it's not that cheap. And uh, another one that popular is uh, long-acting testosterone in oil, which is our certain drugs that called nebido, which is produced by, by Bayer. Okay, uh, um, so it is not cheap as well, it's quite expensive. But the good thing is you inject three monthly. So compare with the inantate, which is weekly, it can go as frequent as two weekly. This is our three monthly. So also it is a higher, higher sorry, you give a supra physical dose, but the levels come down more gradual. So you do not have that peak and the trough as bad as the shorter, shorter duration one. Okay. It's a bit expensive as well. And there, there has been report, reports of uh, oil embolism. So if you inject the patient, you need to monitor them for 20 minutes. Ask them to sit, lie down or sit down, rest for 20 minutes. Okay, Otherwise, they may have uh, oil embolism in the lungs. Okay? It, it, it does happen to a few gentlemen, a few patients. So these are the options available in Malaysia. For oral, we do not advocate it because number one, it, uh, it causes a first pass effect. It goes through the first part effect in the liver. And number two, um, the level do not go as high as, as we want it to be. So it is basically useless la, for, for tablets. That's why we don't use it anymore. Other options which may not be available includes pellets where you insert under the skin. And now in, uh, in the US, they actually have subcutaneous injection. But I don't think it's available in Malaysia yet. Okay, And uh, somehow it's not that popular yet la, in the US. La. Okay, So who which patients okay, should not be on testosterone replacement therapy? Okay, uh, patients who are planning for fertility because testosterone will inhibit sperm production. Patients with breast or prostate cancer. Patients with palpable prostate where you're not sure is it a benign or a malignant lesion. Uh, PSA is high or high risk of prostate CA with a borderline high PSA. Polycythemia due to other reasons, OSA, heavy smoker, okay, untreated severe OSA, severe lower urinary tract symptoms that suggest a prostate disorder, uncontrolled heart failure, myocardial infarction or stroke in the past six months, or thrombophilia. All these patients, they are not supposed to be on testosterone replacement therapy unless you have fixed the underlying problem. Okay, so why do we want to treat them? Okay, so if you treat them, if you replace them, in a young gentleman have a, who, who is still young, uh, in, a, in a child who, or in a young adult, you can improve their secondary sexual characteristics if the puberty is incomplete. 
In adults, okay, you improve the libido, erectile function, and sexual activity. But sometimes you may need uh, a PDF5 in beta as well. Uh, Vigra or others, it may help as well. Sildenafil, uh, Tadenafil. Okay. Um, it may improve their well being and also reduce their depressive symptoms. Okay. It, it does improve the BMD, but so far, no studies have shown that it reduces the risk of fracture. Okay. And also, uh, it reduces your fat mass and muscle strength. So this only works, okay, if your testosterone levels are really, really low. If you are normal and you want to use testosterone for the, these other reasons, okay, the effects may not be proven and there may be more harm than good. Okay, so if you use testosterone, okay, patients may develop polycythemia, okay, they may develop acne and oily skin, okay, and sometimes because we actively replace them and we actively monitor them, you may pick up a higher rates of uh, subclinical prostate cancer, which means that they have no symptoms, but because we screen them annually, we pick, we pick them up. Okay. And then uh, if you have prostate cancer okay, and it's metastatic, you may, you may worsen it with a strong therapy. And of course, you inhibit sperm production. Okay. And others, okay, that may happen is a bit of gynecomastia, okay, male pattern body, okay, and so growth of breast cancer and also will worsen the OSA. So these are a few of the adverse effects if you replace patients with testosterone. Okay. Others, depending on what formulation you use, mood, mood swings okay, due to the peaks and troughs. And if you inject, it will be painful. And if you use uh, the three monthly uh, undecanoid, you may have a bit of oil embolism, which causes uh, coughing episodes. If you use a patch, it can cause ir irritation or itchiness. Okay. If you use a gel, okay, it may transfer to a partner. Okay, it may cause stickiness, dripping, and skin irritation, or sometimes uh, odor at the application site. So, if you decide to give a patient testosterone, you need to monitor. Okay, you need to monitor them. Okay, so what you monitor, of course, the easiest would be your FBC for any polycythemia. You measure the PSA, as well as you ask the patient, how is your mood? Okay, whether there's any peaks and troughs. Okay, whether you need to adjust the dose or the frequency. Okay. So when you monitor, when you measure the testosterone levels, it depends which formulation you use. Okay, if you use uh, the injections, the best would be midway in between. You want to know the, the midway. But then again, if the complaint is the peak or the trough, you can actually measure during the peak and the troughs. So just after injection or just one week or few days before the next injection to see how low it goes. And for transdermal gel, okay, usually we measure at least one week after application because it's quite steady. Okay. okay, so for undecanoid, it is quite stable. Usually you measure just before the next injection. So aside from that, if the patient has osteoporosis or osteopenia, you may want to monitor whether there's any improvement. Okay, and then uh, others will depend what, what are the other symptoms or comorbidities the patients have. Okay, if uh, the PSA goes up, you want to refer to a urologist, especially if the PSA goes up a lot, more than four. Uh, you do a rectal examination, you see a prostate mass, and then the symptoms worsen, or etc. Okay, so uh, I have two more cases which are quite simple, which I'll uh, just swiftly go through. Case three is a 35 years old male, which is very obvious, 43.5, referred to me for query hypogonism. So if you go on with the history, he has uh, sexual dysfunction. The mood is low, okay, poor energy levels, uh, get tired easily, but the libido is okay. So he wants to have sex, but he is unable to do so, okay, as compared to when he was younger. Shaving habits were normal. Gain weight eight years ago, now has a four-year-old son. So if you examine him, he's just obese, no other things, and uh, he has uh, features of insulin resistance. Lah. The testis is 20 mils literally, and the others are normal. So 20 mils means it's most likely normal. Okay. So however, when we repeat the testosterone levels, it is actually quite low, less than eight. So the first question is, is this patient really hypogonadal? Okay, so we need to know that testosterone in your blood, it is bound to SHPG. So there are certain factors that may affect your SHPG. Okay, if, if, uh, if, if obes in obesity and insulin resistant patients, it will be decreased. So the total testosterone will be low. So in this patient, it is worthwhile to do a free testosterone. Okay, so in obese males, total T may be low due to low SHPG. However, there's a condition called male obesity-related secondary hypogonadism, or MOSH, okay, or other terms, okay? So when you have 
when you are obese or you have a lot of insulin resistance, okay, it actually suppresses your hypothalamus and pituitary, reducing your GnRH and LH due to leptin dysfunction and reduces the uh, your the efficacy of your testes to produce testosterone. Okay, so this is just because of insulin resistance and obesity. Okay, it's more of a secondary. If you fix all this, okay, then it will improve on its own. Okay, this is just another uh, diagram showing how obesity affects your testosterone levels as well. It is more prevalent in Malaysia, okay, where we have so many obese patients. Okay, so these kind of patients, should you treat them with testosterone? Okay, the first line of treatment should always be lifestyle modification or you withdraw the potential causes, like the patient is on opiates or steroids. Okay, so we will withdraw this. And the patient loses weight by right, they would improve. Okay, so there is still some debate of using TRT in these patients. For instance, uh, the Americans they say that you can consider to treat it after you counsel the patient and the patient insists for it. Okay, but after six months, if there's no, no improvement, you should stop it because it doesn't work. Okay, however, the Australians they recommend against using of it. European, a bit uh, flexible. You can try three months. If it doesn't improve, you can stop. Okay. And in the UK, also the same. You can try three months. Okay. And you can stop it if there's no improvement. However, the most important is you need to tell the patient the risks and benefits. If they're okay with it, they want to try, then yeah, there may be a role in these patients. Okay. So um, uh, you should only use TRT if sexual functions is involved. If they say, Doctor, I want to try testosterone because my mood is low, I lose weight, control my sugar, okay? Then the evidence is not clear. So at the moment, for functional hypogonad, you should only use it if you have sexual dysfunction, okay? And uh, another important thing is do not use testosterone as an anti-aging treatment or improve the vitality or physical function in frail men or improve cognition in aging males because so far there are no evidence for this. And the last case, a 32-year-old male, a police officer, was admitted for lacuna infarct. So there were some uh, neurological deficits, lah, okay? but it, it improved with time. So the, the neurological team referred to us because of uh, possible anabolic steroids abuse. Okay? So this patient, he has been using various cocktails of anabolic steroids for the past five years. Recommended my gym friends and also from the social media. He bought it online. And apparently, you can get it from Lazada and Shopee and everywhere. Okay? He is not sexually active, no libido, okay, uh, single and smoker. So for him, sex is not something important. He's single and not married. But he says, I have no hypogonadal symptoms. Okay, on examination, he's a very, very muscular male. Okay, the fat percentage is probably less than 10%, but there's no clinical mastia. There's a lot of acne on the trunk and at the back for a 32-year-old male. And the testis was actually a bit small than usual, like 12 to 14. However, the 10 and 5, uh, the sexual criticisms are normal. Uh, Investigation-wise, there is a polycythemia, which we think that is the cause of the, the lacuna infarct. And the others were normal, except the testosterone was very, very low. Okay, uh, We did not proceed with the LS FSH at the time. So this gentleman is very, very masculine, but biochemically, he is hypogonadal because of the low testosterone. Okay, Why? It's because he is using anabolic steroids. Okay, so when you inject anabolic steroids, the dose will be very, very high. It's actually supra physiological. And the patients, they actually they have a lot of cocktails they, okay, that they play with. So they will use orals or injectable cholesterol. They will add on with tomifin, uh, beta HCG, anastrozole, and various things. Okay, why is to reduce um, uh, to reduce male body, to reduce uh, what do you call that, uh, gynecomastia? and uh, reduce the uh, peaks and trop symptoms as well. So they, they actually know what to do, how to play with it, okay? So for this patient, we explain, you know, you have to stop all this, you have a stroke, okay? And then for your testosterone, you won't do anything. With time, it will recover on its own. So if you abuse steroids, you can have a lot of complications, okay? Uh, it can be aggressive behavior, okay? You may have a stroke or heart attack, and uh, you are infertile, testis will, will shrink, okay? And you have acne, alopecia, and others as well. Okay, so this case, uh, to date, how to treat these patients, there's actually no standard treatment regime, okay, because there are lack of trials and evidence. Usually we will wait, we tell the patients, it will recover on its own, but how soon it is, it depends. It may take months, 
years or maybe never. Okay. Uh, some endocrinologists have tried using serms, okay, tamoxifen or comifene, or even low dose testosterone to help. But then again, uh, there are, there's actually no guidelines for this lab. Okay. How do you want to confirm a patient is on this? Is um uh, the by right you need to do a drug doping test, but it is only available in the sports scene. So you have to go to Madis Sukanagara or Jabata Kimia Nagara. Okay, in, in hospitals, we don't do this lah, except you are if it's uh, academic purposes. Okay. So to end my talk today, so uh, symptoms of hypogonism may be very, very vague, and you may need a uh, high suspicion, okay, especially when patients do not have sexual features. Uh, it is very important for you to examine the testes. If you suspect hypogonism, please examine the testes. If it's small, then yes, there is something wrong. But if it is normal volume, then usually it is functional, okay? And uh, you can do testosterone to, to confirm, but it should be done early morning and a fasting sample. Sometimes it may not be easy to interpret the testosterone because there's a lot of interference, okay? And uh, from, if it's organic hypogonism, then you should treat it there's an organic lesion, but for functional causes, there is still a gray area. Okay, so that ends my talk for today. I'm uh, happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Dr. Kang. I think that was very interesting and the cases were all very relevant uh, to day-to-day -day practice. You took us from primary to secondary um, to functional as well as um, uh, anabolic steroid abuse. Um, so that was really very relevant. So there's a few questions for you, Dr. Kang. Um, again, I think the audience wants some clarity with regards to when do we measure total T, when do we measure free T, um, and there's also a question about SHBG. Does that need to always be done? When do you do it in clinical practice? Okay, um, uh, free T, uh, the problem with free T is one is it's very expensive, uh, and number two is uh, it's not easy, it's not widely available and and it depends on what platform you use. The ideal, ideal platform to measure is uh, equilibrium dialysis, which is not available in Malaysia. Um, so when you send for SHPG, in big, sorry, you send for free tea in bigger labs like Ribbles and others, it should be accurate. But then again, you need to take note that um, uh, when it was taken, whether it was fasting. So free tea is the best. But if it's expensive or not available, you can actually use uh, Total T and SHPG as well. But you need to take note that certain conditions may alter the SHPG. For instance, in diabetic patients or severely obese, or if they have other things, if they're malnourished, they have other conditions, then the SHPG will affect it as well. Um, and there are two schools of thoughts for SHPG. Some say that it matters, some say it does not matter. But at the meanwhile, for clinical purposes, we will still use it if we suspect but if you're not sure, you can always refer it to an endocrinologist. Class. So we'll, we'll consider the whole big picture and we'll see if the patient is really, really uh, hypogonadal. So is there any instances where you'll calculate free T rather than sending it off to the lab? I mean, because that might be an easy, cheaper way yeah. of doing it. Yeah, so if the patient cannot afford it or because of cost, cost reasons, you can, you can calculate. There's actually websites with uh, free websites with a calculator on it. So you... Usually, we, usually, if a patient is lean and, uh, and there's no other secondary factors, the total T is more accurate. However, for instance, you encounter, you know, the total T is actually borderline, patient is very obese or diabetic, then there is a role of SHBG. Like. Otherwise, usually, we do not do. Just total T will be good enough. Sure. Um, there's a question again about monitoring testosterone level on patients on different formulation. Maybe, I think you did mention it. But yeah. maybe just quickly summarize and let them know because again they're asking. Yeah. So if you if you're using gel, so you can do it anytime. Okay. But probably morning, at least two weeks after initiating the gel. But if it's uh using a short acting, sorry, uh, uh, uh monthly or three weekly injection, then uh, usually we measure halfway as well. But if the patient complains of peaks or troughs, we can measure the peak or the trough level to see how high or high low it is to adjust the frequency or the dosing. If it's three monthly, then usually we measure a week or two weeks just before the next injection. Okay, there's some question uh, with regards to your case as well, Kang, about, um, you know, especially the gentleman who was desiring fertility yeah. with uh, secondary hypogonadism. So, I mean, would you consider giving them uh, HCG, uh, I mean, LH or FSH, or as well as, I mean, there's along that same lines, I mean, there's also some questions about sperm banking. I mean, it's two different things. Um, yeah, fertility. So for patients with secondary as in a pituitary problem, so what we want to do is uh, we will treat it with, we will, we will collaborate with uh, fertility experts to give uh, 
HCG or HMG, sorry, LH or FSH to induce uh, puberty and also induce spermatogenesis. Because once you give TRT, there'll be no more sperms. So usually we will, we will start by inducing spermatogenesis. And once we able to sperm bank or the patient does, has completed the family, then you can actually convert to TRT. La. But then again, Sometimes using HCG or using um, uh, that, trying to induce protonosis, the, the testosterone levels may not be good enough. So it's not easy, la, depending on how big the testes are. Yeah, so I mean, where are the places where we can do sperm banking in Malaysia? Um, uh, I'm not familiar with this, but most private fertility centers, they may have, they may offer this option. Yeah. Sure. I mean, I... I... I think UKM has it in from the past, but I'm not sure whether they still have it. I mean, for university. Okay, so there's um, um, some practical questions about how long does TRT go on for? I mean, whether it's primary or secondary, is it lifelong for a man? Men never menopause or, I mean, andropause never happens. How long do we keep giving it? And along that same line, there's a, probably somebody is also concerned whether testicular size will regress with aging. <laughs> um. Everything regresses with aging, la, but then again, with age, it should not regress too much. La. So maybe from 20 meals, you go down to 18 meals, maybe that's acceptable. Yeah, that's one. For how long should we replace them as long as the patient needs it and uh, as long as he is safe with it. So if the patient has no other reasons to stop it, you can actually continue. If the patient has a prostate issue, that has a stroke or a heart problem, then you may want to consider cutting it down. Or the patient tells you, doctor, I don't need it anymore. Okay, I don't need sex anymore. It is enough for me. My wife has passed away or something else. So I don't need it. Then you can consider stopping it. Mm. Yeah, I mean, the oldest patient I have is a 84-year-old uh, for which I closely monitor the, the prostate and the PSA. But it's more for, because he also has osteoporosis. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think it's more for other beyond, uh, you know, sexual of, uh, sort of benefits. So there's question on uh, testo gel. Um, once it's applied, how long should we avoid physical contact? I mean, with partner or children? Um, it, it actually takes a few hours for it to dry up. La. Usually we advise that once you apply, do not contact. Go back home, bathe, only you contact. La. Okay. Um, again, there's a question about functional hypogonadism. I think people still need more clarity. I mean, how, how, what was your own person? I mean, I know you showed us some guidelines, yeah. um, the European, the American, as well as Australian, uh, but uh, what is your own personal uh, advice for that? Um, is... By right, you need to, to, to solve what is the underlying problem. If it's obesity or diabetes, you need to control the, the sugar and the weight. If it's due to chronic Opiates use, you need to tell them to stop it. And then so it actually depends what is what is the reason. If it's aging due to old age, uh, then we will tell them that you know it's aging process, and then uh, it may not improve on its own. But if you really, really want to use it for your for your sexual function, we may try, but you need to know what are the risks and what are the benefits. If they're okay, then I'll give them a short trial. Uh, then if they're okay, we continue. If they're not okay, no response, then we just stop it. Like, mm. Uh, Kang, there's a question about what happens when the hematocrit or the PSA is going up. I mean, what do we what what do we do normally? Should we cut down the dose? Um, I mean, like make it less frequent, or should we actually just withhold it altogether and then check again? Or what? What's the how do we approach that? Uh, the best way is to change the formulation because usually uh, polycythemia occurs with uh injections. So if the patient is able to afford a uh, gel, then they'll be the best. Otherwise, you may have to cut down on the dose. Mm. So how much is the gel, um, Kang? Because I have not used the gel before uh, in Malaysia. How much yeah. is the gel? Um, per month, you can go up to 400 ringgit. Oh, okay. Yeah. For someone who is on enantiate, that's quite a big jump in, in price. Yeah. So there's again a question about bone protection and testosterone. Um, how often in a, in a young hypogonadal man, uh, how, would, how often would you monitor the bone density? Um, a... In a young patient, yeah, for me, I would do once, and if there's abnormality, I will replace with testosterone if it's a clear cut hypogonadal case. But then again, you know that if the patient is already on testosterone, uh, the BLE will improve, but the fracture risk will not really improve. So it depends what we want to see. If you just want to monitor and see whether the BMD improves, then you can do it. But if you just want to do it to, to measure the fracture risk, then it may not be necessary. So for me, it is not easy, 
But uh, but I strongly believe that once patient is on replacement, their BMD should improve and the risk should come down. Like. Mm. So as usual, maybe I'll do it as per the guidelines suggested, maybe two yearly or three yearly, depending on how's the BMD. Right? Okay, there's also a question about all these uh, gym buffs who actually go and use all these anabolic I mean, I have seen quite a number over the years. Lah. And like you say, they are very clever and they have a nice regime, isn't it? Like when to take tamoxifen or clomiphene, make sure they don't get gynecomastia, when to add on what. Sometimes there's a beta agonist, there's a steroid, there's a testosterone. So is there any um, uh, lab assays that can actually measure it? up? Because we know that when we measure total T, it will be low in our assay. But is there a way to measure these exogenous steroids? Um, I don't think labs will, will, will provide this service because one is it's really done and it's expensive. Um, mostly they are done by the sports lab, lab for doping purposes. But if the lab provides uh, epi testosterone, you can measure the ratio. Lab, but I think it's, it's actually not practical. Uh, the first thing with uh, these abusers is, number one, they will not admit they're abusing it unless they, they repented. I think they want to stop using it, then they admit. Otherwise, it's very difficult. So if they are in self-denial and they still have body dysmorphia, no matter what you tell them, they will still deny. So you have to wait until they, you know, they, they finally realize that it's wrong and come to seek treatment. Otherwise, it's very difficult to treat them. Yeah. Wait until they grow up. La. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it, there, there's a question again, Kang. Probably this is the last question. Um, is there any role of monitoring LH, FSH in primary hypogonadism while on replacement? Because like measuring TSH while on tyroxine. Um, you give testosterone, do you measure LH, FSH uh, to use that as a marker for adequacy of replacement? Uh, no. is, it, is it just testosterone? So far, no evidence suggests to use that yet. And usually we just monitor t uh, the testosterone level that should be adequate. Mm. Okay, I think maybe we take this last quick question. Is there any contraindication to use testosterone with family members of BRCA positive breast CA? Um, uh, e, okay, it is BRCA positive. So I think if is that's the case, um, so far, no guidelines on it, but for me, I think that if the patient has undergone testing on himself and he's BRCA positive, then I will discuss the risk of using testosterone. There may be a small risk of getting breast cancer due to his yeah. uh, uh, susceptibility, yeah. but uh, otherwise, if the patient can't do the testing and he still insists, maybe we'll do but very, very vigilant monitoring. But then again, he, he should know that the risk is there. Like, yeah, the most important thing. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kang, and thank you very much to all of you uh, who have been a wonderful audience and very interactive. I think this is really an interesting topic. Uh, we learned a lot from Dr. Kang this evening, um, and I think I'll pass over to you, Dr. Priscilla, for some housekeeping. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Pro, uh, Dr. Kong, Dr. Kang and Prof. Jaya for the enlightening topic. There will be QR code at the end of the session for